this morning. It's good to be anywhere. The way our world is turning upside down. It's a privilege to be anywhere. It's a privilege to be in the land of the living. It's a privilege to be with you. And I want to thank uh, Sister Phoebe Brown and all the members of the committee uh, for this warm welcome to this cold place. Uh, I was a little late this morning scraping the ice off of my car. Um, I was telling my friends from Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, my mother's in, in that sorority, and she gave me the car, so my car is green. I'm the only 63-year-old man I know who drives a green car. And um, not green ecologically, it's a 2000 Mercury, so it's not ecologically sound at all, so you'll probably chase me out after this is over. But it's a, it's a privilege to be here on a, a special day, especially with it being Martin Luther King Day. And as uh, Phoebe said, um, I am a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, I went to Morehouse in large measure because of the legacy of Dr. King. That was attractive to me as a northerner who had gone to white prep schools uh, most of his life. I wanted a different type of experience that was conducive to producing black leadership. And so I felt that a historically black college would be the great place to do that. And so I did my undergraduate work there. And then my, um, my current job for the last 15 years has been on the faculty of another HBCU, Howard University in Washington, DC. It's also important for me to be here today because of the intersection between Martin Luther King and his dream for a more just society and the issue of mass incarceration that faces us all. Because if you were to read my bio online, you'd see my degrees, you would see uh, the books that I've written, you would see the articles that I've done, you would see that I have a Phi Beta Kappa key, you would see that I've been given a number of awards. What you would not see is 10002648 which was my inmate number at George W. Hill Correctional Facility. And um, that was a formative experience in my own life. Um, I wish I could say, as, as some of you good progressive social activists, that you went to jail for justice, you went to jail for truth, and you went to jail for peace. I went to jail for Christian brothers. I went to jail for old Mr. Boston. I went to jail for Thunderbird. Um, I went to jail for a variety of uh, alcohol-related instances. In fact, my, my, my tagline is, I'm allergic to alcohol. When I drink, I break out in handcuffs. So the reality for me as a person in recovery and as a formerly incarcerated person is that there is a real intersection between the King dream and between what we are facing today and dealing with with regards to our current situation of mass incarceration. It is Martin Luther King Day, but there'd be no Martin Luther King without Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was the seamstress. <laughs> who refused to give up her seat on a public Montgomery bus on December 1st, 1955. But there would be no Rosa Parks without Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson was the chair of the Women's Political Council of Montgomery, Alabama. It was a coalition of women who were tired of the segregation that black women in particular faced in Montgomery, most often manifested in how they were treated when they rode public buses. Joanne Robinson brought the women together 
to organize the bus boycott, women who taught at Alabama State, women who worked as seamstresses, women who worked in journalism, women who worked in, 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 the bus in businesses, all of these various vocational callings at one table, making a decision to do something about a system that was unjust. The reason we celebrate Martin Luther King was that these women came together and they said, we want the clergy to lead. And so Martin Luther King was elected not because he was already established as a civil rights leader. Martin Luther King, you, you have a young mayor here, don't you? You have a young mayor, young man. Martin Luther King was 26 years old, so don't tell me young people can't do things. Martin King was 26 years old. He was very articulate, but he had one thing that was absolutely perfect for leadership in Montgomery. He was new. He didn't know anybody. He hadn't been there long enough to make any enemies. And so Martin Luther King was chosen as much for his naivete as he was for his intellect. It was the women that did the organizing. And though King gave voice to the movement, without the grassroots organizing of Joanne Robinson, without bringing in the local college, you have a college here, I think, called Corn Something. <laughs> without bringing in the resources of the local higher education institution, Alabama State, without bringing in the resources of women from the faith community and from the business community, Montgomery doesn't happen and we're all at work or in school today. The fact of the matter is that we have lost the drive and the strive towards co collaborative coalition building, multi-sectoral approaches to dealing with social justice. Because what would have happened if Rosa Parks had showed up today? If Rosa Parks had come to our communities today, that would have been one of two responses. Some people would have said, we need to have a service delivery response. Rosa Parks was segregated against on the bus. We have to make sure she gets to work. And they would have gotten her a car. That's one way to get around injustice, help individuals deal with the injustice, overcome the injustice without changing the system. <laughs> Service delivery is important, but you've got to deal with the system. And, and, and then there would have been some good progressive folks who would have said, Rosa Parks got discriminated against, let's start a study group. <laughs> let, let, let's get a book about mass discrimination on buses. And let's read it together and see if in reading our study book, we can come up with some answers to mass discrimination, mass incarceration, no, mass discrimination. Either we deliver services or we read a book. Somewhere along the line, we've lost the holistic component of a movement that does both. Service delivery systems are short in some cases because we serve people without getting to know them. If I were to give a title to this talk, it would be, you can't change the system if you don't know the people. You can serve people and never really get to know them. I, I used to be a pastor, and when I was a pastor, we had a soup kitchen, and we used to feed more people than anybody in our section of Philadelphia. We had one rule, nobody eats twice, because we wanted to serve as many people as possible, so everybody only got one helping. One day, one of the ministers in the church came up to me and he said, Pastor, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, people are eating twice. I said, they're breaking our rule. He said, no, pastor, it's worse than that. They come downstairs and they eat. And then they go outside and they change clothes with each other. <laughs> and they come back downstairs and eat a second time. I said, so, so they're breaking our rule and they're getting over on us. They're fooling us. He said, pastor, you don't get it. He said, if you and I changed clothes and went back downstairs, people would still know that you're you and I'm me. The only reason they can fool us is we don't know who we're serving. You can serve somebody without really getting 
to know somebody. You can do them a favor without engaging them in their full humanity. And service delivery programs are good, social service agencies are important, but if we are going to deliver services, we have to get engaged with the actual people who are being impacted by the issues that we're serving them about. <laughs> Policy people find it easier sometimes to get involved in system change and never getting their hands dirty with the actual people that are involved in the system. They have this sense that if we can change the rules, everything gets better, but I don't want them necessarily in my yard, in my neighborhood, in my community. We, we want to change the laws, but never get involved in the lives of people. The fact of the matter is there has never been a sustainable movement for social change in this country that was not involved around the lives of people. If you want a sustainable movement for change in reducing mass incarceration, you need to know the people who've been impacted by mass incarceration. That's why I give you my inmate number, because I'm one of them. And all of us know somebody, all of us know someone in our families, in our communities that has been impacted by mass incarceration. We just don't talk about it. We don't tell you that we were in prison. We don't tell you that we were in jail because of the shame and the stigma that's involved. I know I felt it when I got locked up in the county jail, I didn't want anybody to know that I was there, I, especially because I had been a pastor in that county and people knew who I was. I wouldn't give them my name. They asked me, what's your name? I just tell them Doc, D-O-C, Doc. I was the only inmate that had a monogram uniform. Think about that one. And so I was okay for two weeks. And then a young man came up to me and he looked and he said, Pastor, what are you doing in here? I looked up at him and said, who wants to know? He told me his name. I said, I don't know you. He said, well, I used to play drums in your church. I said, son, I'm sorry, I don't know you. He said, my mother's name is Muriel. She was on your staff. And I was face to face with Muriel's son. Before I left that jail, I met seven young men from my congregation. I had no idea when I'm pastored their mothers and their wives and their sisters and their cousins, I had no idea that they had family members that are incarcerated. Our challenge is to take that connection that we have waxed invisible and turn it into something that is right there in front of our faces. One of our problems is we're shame. Because we didn't raise them to be that way. We stigmatize them just like society does. We give them names we like convicts and inmates. And when they come home, they're ex-cons and they're ex-felons. Even, even no matter how long you've been home, you, you still have a label on you that dehumanizes you. How would you like it if every place you went, you were an ex, whatever the worst thing is you did? The reality is that we're people. And we have lives and we have families. We cut, we bleed when we're cut. We cry when we're hurt. And in order to make policy change effective, you have to connect with us who've been through the system because those who are closest to the problem are also those who are closest to the solution. It's important. You cannot sustain a movement without engaging people's lives. You can't change policies if you don't know the people. What will sustain your movement is names, not numbers. Stories, not statistics. Faces, not facts. What sustains a movement is coming to full realization of the humanity of the other who is behind bars or who has done a bid. I teach in a seminary and, and my students are supposed to be reform, future religious leaders of America. One of my students said to me, I can't deal with inmates. I can't deal with prisoners. I said, really? She said, yes, they give me the creeps. She had been driving through one of those little towns where when you, get, when, you, when you run a stoplight, you have to pay your ticket right away or you go to the holding cell. And so she had spent the night in a holding cell with those people. And of course, that was beneath her. She was married to a physician. You know, some folks are just doctors, you know. Her husband was a physician. <laughs> 
And I said, and, and you're, you're, you're a Christian. She said, that's right. She said, but, but I'm not, I, I, I can't deal with prisoners. I said, you're, 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 you're a Christian? You can't deal with prisoners? She said, mm, no. I said, well, how do you read the Bible? She said, what are you talking about? I said, we have to take stuff out the Bible if you don't like inmates. She said, really? I said, sure. If you don't like inmates, we've got to take out the book of Genesis. Because Joseph was an inmate. If you don't like inmates, we've got to take out the book of Daniel, because Daniel was a two-time loser, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were on death row. If you don't like inmates, we've got to take out the book of Jeremiah, because he was in solitary confinement. If you don't like inmates, we've got to take out the book of Revelation, because John wrote that when he was locked up. If you don't like inmates, you've got to take out First and Second Peter, because Peter got locked up, and then when he came home after a prayer meeting, the church wouldn't let him in, so things really haven't changed that much for people that come home. If you don't like inmates, you've got to run around telling people, I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me, because it was written by an inmate named Paul while he was locked up in Rome. If you can't deal with inmates, you shouldn't go to church on Good Friday, because Jesus was in custody when he was crucified. If you don't like inmates, me, sweetheart, you in the wrong religion. The shame and the stigma that we put onto men and women who are defined for the rest of their lives by one mistake keeps us from engaging them as fully human. We're all connected. We're all in this together. And if you don't know anybody who's been incarcerated, it's probably because of the shame and the stigma and the fear of telling the truth about our histories and our backgrounds. And so we deal with the shame and the stigma. I'm very fortunate. I go to a church that, that deals with the shame and the stigma. In, in, in the church where I go, where that I attend, um, if, you, if you break the law and you get arrested, you get up in front of the church, you tell them what you did, you challenge the kids not to do the same thing, and then the church walks with you. My church wrote letters to my judge. My church showed up in court. This is the church I was a member of, not the one I had been a pastor of. They showed up in court. They wrote letters to my judge. And when, when I was facing a five-year state prison sentence, the judge instead gave me one to two county because he wanted me to be close to my support network. Because that judge recognized what many of us who do research on reentry realize, that the two most important factors as to whether or not a person is successful when she or he comes home from jail or prison are not jobs and housing, but it's their attitudes and their social networks. We need people who will walk Get engaged with people who are in the system and help them to have a proper attitude as they come home and also have them get a social network that will reinforce positive values. Those two are more important than jobs and housing. Jobs and housing are important, but here's the counterfactual. I can get you a job, I can get you a house, but if your mind hasn't changed and your social networks haven't changed, you'll probably lose both of them. And so there's a personal dimension to this that is required for us to build a sustainable movement. Recognizing their full humanity and mobilizing organizations that are willing to connect. And when we begin to collect the stories of the men and women coming home, and we can come to understand what it means to be in an overcrowded state system or in an overcrowded county system, and we come to understand what it means to be over-sentenced in a federal system, when we come to understand how so many people's lives are made worse by incarceration and not by being made better, we will have the information and the data that we need to build the sustainable movement, and it won't be built on facts, it will be built on faces. We've seen a number of changes around the country. There's a program in Brooklyn, New York, called Common Justice. Common Justice is an alternative sentencing program for violent offenders. It's the only alternative sentencing program for violent offenders in the country. Most alternative sentencing programs target low-level nonviolent offenses. Common Justice targets people who have been convicted of violent crimes. One of the things that Common Justice understands is that 60% of all victims of violent crime prefer more investment in treatment and less harsh sentences. You can look it up, Pew Research Forum, 60%. I mean, I, I got colleges around me. Y'all look stuff up. 60% prefer more investment in treatment and less harsh sentences. And so these people who have committed violent crimes in Brooklyn, if they 
fit three criteria are able to move into this program called Common Justice. Number one, they have to admit their guilt. Because those of us who have committed crimes, those of us who have been arrested, have to acknowledge our own complicity in our situation. Even if it was overzealous policing, even if it's unfair sentencing, we put ourselves most often in some type of position where our vulnerability is exposed. And so we have to take responsibility. So number one, they have to admit they did it. Number two, the victim has to agree to them coming in. And as I indicated, the Pew numbers indicate that 60% of all victims want treatment. There was one woman in, in Brooklyn whose son had been brutally beaten. Her nine-year-old had been brutally beaten by an older man. And, 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 and they offered him an opportunity to get into the program, but his mother, the mother, this woman, had to say yes. And so when they interviewed her, this is exactly what she said. She said, that man was standing in front of me right now. I would go and get my machete. Notice she didn't say a machete. She said, my machete. And I would hack him to little pieces. And I would take the pieces and put them in a bag and bury them under the floor of my basement and sleep soundly for the first time since he beat my son. But I also know this. If he goes to prison, he's going to come out worse than he was when he goes in. And so as much as I hate him and as much as I detest him, put him in your program and give him a chance because I don't want him coming out worse in three years when my son is 12. Common Justice has taken 90 violent offenders over a five-year period and put them in this alternative treatment program that deals with their own trauma, that deals with their own victimization because most people who perpetuate who, who, who perpetrate violent crimes, have been victims of violence themselves. They put them through this program. Eight, 90 people have been through this program. There has been one violent rearrest in five years. There are alternatives to incarceration. In New Jersey, the front page of the Newark Star-Ledger, our main paper in North Jersey, Headlines were blaring yesterday because the bail bondsmen are upset because they're losing money because January 1st, comprehensive bail reform was passed into law, it became effective January 1st, that now removes cash bail as an impediment for people in pretrial de uh, detention. <laughs> Bipartisan legislation. Governor Chris Christie, hey, look, a broken clock is right twice a day, okay? <laughs> Governor Chris Christie, <laughs> it's not my favorite Republican. I'm, I'm a moderate Republican, but there's other kinds of Republicans, I understand. One being inaugurated Friday. At any rate, Governor Chris Christie signed it into law. And now, instead of cash bail as the primary way of determining whether or not a man or a woman will have to spend their pretrial time before a conviction in jail because they don't have $250, every person who is arrested and taken into the system will be given a risk assessment device to determine whether or not they are a flight risk and then maybe more importantly, whether or not they are a community security risk. And they're working out the algorithms in Philadelphia to do the same thing. I hope they do that. I live in Philadelphia. When I read that you have 75 beds in the Tompkins County Jail, I started laughing because there were 75 of us in the holding cell. Because the county where I live, just outside of Philadelphia, the county jail holds 1,800. And it's overcrowded. So if we're working on bail reform in Philadelphia, if we're working on, if we've seen successful bail reform in New Jersey, there ought to be something that can be done in, in Tompkins County that will make overcrowding in our jails and the need for expansion without creative thought about alternatives disappear. The fact of the matter is, we've seen it. We've seen it in New Jersey. We've, we we're seeing it in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, it's, things are so bad that we have now have the same number of people in our county jail system that New York City does. New York City has 8,000 people on Rikers Island. Philadelphia has 8,000 people on State Road.
And New York City has five times the population that New York City does. The reason is very simple. Philadelphia's antiquated bail system that keeps people locked up. 60% of those 8,000 people have not been tried. They are in detention. You do the math on 60% of 8,000. The reality is that that's being changed. We got a new mayor who stopped construction of the new city jail and said, if we've got enough money to build a new jail, then we've got enough money to invest in treatment and change. And I'm away from home so I can say this. Our old mayor that helped ramp things up looked like me, and the new mayor who wants to change things doesn't look like me. So at a certain point, I don't care what color you are, my question is, are you on the side of justice? Are you on the side of truth? And are you on the side of equality? I don't want an affirmative action mayor. I want a mayor who takes action for justice and will make changes. The men and women in those jails and prisons represent the future of change for this nation. We look at them as thugs, killers, animals, addicts. The fact of the matter is that they're all people and they're all capable of change. The best classes I ever taught were the eight years that I taught at Sing Sing Prison. Those men did a 42 credit masters in 10 months. They always did their homework. They always read their assignments, unlike my current university students. I'm sure that Cornell and Ithaca have different experiences. Your students read everything. Uh, wait for the lightning. Um, and some of those men have gone on to make incredible contributions. Just last month, John Valverde, one of my students from Sing Sing, who did eight, 16 years for murder, was named the national director of Youth Build. Darren Ferguson, another one of my students from Sing Sing, who did uh, time seven and a half years for third degree attempted murder, is now the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Far Rockaway and the, the assistant dean of students of LaGuardia Community College. Men who've come through those programs are world changers. It all depends on how you look at them. Howard Thurman was a theologian former chaplain at Boston University, the first African-American chaplain at Boston University, chaplain at Howard University, 1911 graduate of Morehouse College. Thurman grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida, small rural community in the middle of the Florida Peninsula. And when Thurman was growing up in Daytona Beach, the neighborhood had one white family that was left. And they were very bitter about being surrounded by all of these black people in this community. They especially didn't like Dr. Thurman's family. His was being raised by his grandmother who had, was born in slavery. One of the things that his grandmother tried to do was to win over her neighbor through kindness and through generosity and her neighbor was hearing none of it. In fact, the neighbor was so bitter about the Thurmans living next door that she went to her grandson and she said, I want you to go out in the backyard where the chicken coops are. And I want you to take a spatula and scrape the chicken manure off the floor of the chicken coop and dump it into Thurman's backyard. Wait until they're watching so they'll know what we think of them. And so the grandson went out in the back and he saw Mrs. Thurman across the fence and he scratched the chicken manure off the bottom of the chicken coop and dumped it in the Thurman's backyard right in front of her face. Some months later, the grandmother got sick. And Mrs. Thurman decided that she was going to try to do something nice, even though she knew her neighbor did not like her. She had, was committed to doing something to bless her. And so she took her antagonist a bowl of chicken soup and some flowers. And even this evil antagonist, this, this woman who detested her, melted at this act of kindness and generosity. She said, Mrs. Thurman, thank you for the chicken soup. I really appreciate it. Mrs. Thurman said, you're welcome. She said, and these flowers are beautiful. Mrs. Thurman said, I grew them myself. She said, these are, these are beautiful. The stems are so long and green. 
and the flowers are so colorful and you're, you're ahead of me, right? <laughs> Mrs. Thurman said, remember that chicken manure you dumped in my backyard? You saw that as something evil, but God saw it as fertilizer. And out of that place where you poured evil onto me, God was able to grow something beautiful to bless you. We have been dumping fertilizer of racism, the fertilizer of mass incarceration, the fertilizer of ethnic oppression, the fertilizer of misogyny, the fertilizer of economic oppression. We've been dumping them on communities time and time again, and the residents of those communities end up in our jails and prisons. But I tell you, if you lose that as fertilizer, you will find that they will come back to reform and change the very communities that once dumped on them. So when they start pouring for fertilizer on Friday, just remember, it can be used to grow righteousness. Thank you.